welcome back for anybody who's watching the exhibition right now. Uh, we've turned down the videos because we have another talk and we're so excited to have here with us Maria Veitz, who's the curator and moderator of this next panel. And also with her, Andrea Stanislav, uh, Axel Strachnoy, and Mika Yavala. Um, so I'll give it to you, Maria. Thank you, thank you, Karina. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you guys today, and thank you so much for preferring uh, being in the shelter to being outside on this nice and sunny day. We northern people know that sunny days are rare, so I, I appreciate very much your engagement today. So um, the, the discussion, this conversation is called Cosmic Ecology Reimagined Futures Rediscovered Pasts. And um, um, I think uh, that you know, discussing the space um, is again becoming quite urgent with the situation when we're um, continuously expanding and exhausting our planetary resources and thinking of, of alternative ways of um, you know, moving, escaping, or fleeing to, to other planets, the idea that has been in the air since the very origin of um, you know, this space, the cosmic thought. Um, so now we're kind of you know, getting back to that whole narrative. Um, and with the entire, um, I would say, spiral return of the Cold War rhetorics, um, or the rhetorics of conflict between nations, between countries, between societies. Um, looking back at the space programs of, of the Cold War um, is becoming necessary again for um, maybe discussing the relations between um, different countries and cultures, and also for um, getting to know maybe a little bit more about our past, shared past often, um, and I think that there's a certain need for revisiting uh, certain historical narratives and see um, if some of the narratives have been presented in a way um, that actually is different from the, their factual representation. Um, I would like to introduce um, our speakers. Um, and, oh, sorry. and the guest of, of the discussion, Axel Strashnoy. He is the head of the 60th Anniversary Celebrations Organizing Committee at the Finnish Astronautical Society, and nominated expert at the International Technical Committee on the Cultural Utilization of Space of the International uh, Astronautical Federation. We'll ask Axel to speak more about that. Um, a flight operations director at Colme Peruna Space, um, an organization dedicated to the cultural exploration of the outer space. Um, Axel is a visual artist who is uh, born in Argentina. Now he's based in Helsinki, and here he has been uh, worked quite uh, intensively um, in the field of the relationship between humans and the mechanical and symbolic devices uh, they used to apprehend, represent, and archive the world. Um, then we also have, and very proud and very happy to have uh, Mika Yalava, who is the president of the Finnish Astronautical Society. Uh, he is a space enthusiast and a rocketeer. Um, uh, Mika dedicates much of his free time to observation of the practical phenomena resulting from the gas thermodynamics of uh, deflagration and control oxidization of solid propellants. He is a scientist also by trade. Also, his work is more down to earth than his hobbies. He will be defending his doctoral dissertation in the field of water resources and global food security this autumn, something we would also address uh, later because I think this topic is um, important uh, to discuss um, in connection to the overall, overall theme of the festival. Uh, and virtually, but not physically, unfortunately, we have with us today Andrea Stanislav. Uh, she's based in New York, um, and she also works in St. Petersburg and Bloomington, Indiana. Um, she is now working towards her um, PhD at the European Graduate School. Um, Andrea's uh, hybrid practice uses sculpture and content with collage and text constructions, video installations and public performance happening uh, to tap into the utopic, philosophical and cultural phenomenon of Russian cosmism. 
Um, so she works a lot with, with the legacy of uh, such thinkers as Nikolai Fyodorov, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, and Vladimir Vimatsky, amongst others, who formed ideas of active approaches to space exploration and colonization, personal immortality, and resurrection of the dead. Unfortunately, Andrea is stuck in Estonia, where she was supposed to renew her uh, visa, um, uh, her Russian visa, and she did manage to join us today, but uh, she will still be presented um, in the form of um, uh, a video talk that she kindly recorded for us. Um, so, <clears throat> um, um, I, I myself started to, to work with the um, topic of um, silenced um, narratives and sort of this um, um, collective, um, um, forgetting the word, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, un unresolved questions of the past and collective amnesia and um, um, the ways the past could be revisited through different lenses and um, the space and the cosmos and the cosmic narrative has also become um, a certain um, point of interest for me, and I wanted to start um, this conversation with um, discussing or bringing uh, to your attention the um, uh, project that I recently curated in Moscow. It was a solo show of New York-based artist Evgeny Fix, um, who um, usually works with uh, the post-Soviet narratives. He also explores um, collective public memory, representation of the Soviet experience in the post-Soviet era. And um, he deals with this kind of micro, micro narratives, micro stories, and the Jewish Soviet experience is also very often in the center of his, um, of his works. Um, so this project is uh, based on um, stories of three people who were um, actively participating in the Soviet uh, space program, but were, whose names we rarely remember or even know, because as we know, the, uh, the space program um, being always you know, somewhat of a branding of a certain nation, of a country, and especially um, in, in, uh, in the 60s when it was actively developing and when the Soviet Union was very proud of you know, being the, the first super uh, cosmic power. The branding of the people who are representing um, the space program and uh, the nation, the USSR in the space was also very specific, very ideologically charged and very ethnically, um, um, I would say, uh, refined. So um, the idea of you know, Jews representing the uh, um, Soviet space program would be uh, something that would not be um, appreciated by the Soviet government of the time. And uh, the idea of this very project is to take this uh, silence, hidden, non-public um, ethnic narratives um, into the public domain and um, through um, the kind of inter intertwining of uh, the Soviet Jewish experience and um, the, uh, the history of the space program to, to look again at the history of the Soviet Union and um, the ethnic policy of the Soviet Union and how the um, certain narratives, uh, um, achievements, history were being manipulated through ideological mechanisms. Uh, very briefly, I'll just uh, speak about the three people who were uh, at the core of the project um, one of them is Wolf Gordian, uh, um, a anarchist and enthusiast who, who was um, very much encouraged by the post-revolutionary ideas and development of the young state, of the young um, Soviet Union, and um, being very interested also in the um, beginning of the cosmos, cosmic idea and development of the Russian cosmism as a, as a new direction, as a new line of thought. He came up um, with um, a new language, AO. Uh, it's an interplanetary language which should be used for 
um, communication not only between people from different countries but also with um, different creatures or minds uh, who live in different planets. Um, the, the language has its grammar, um, it had this very strong appeal for uh, all the humanity to be brought together, to be communicating, to be connected through one unified uh, form of communication. <clears throat> and um, in, 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 in this project, Evgeny Fix is um, creating a certain parallel between our and Yiddish, which was the, the language of um, the Ashkenazi Jews, of um, European Jews, um, and the language which, of course, was um, extinct to a very large extent uh, during the uh, 20th century because of the Holocaust and uh, migration and refugees, um, and fleeing of Jews um, out of um, Europe occupied by Nazis. Um, another um, story is the story of Polish scientist Ari Sternfeld, who actually has contributed. You, you can see him here in this image, this uh, man with was a beer standing next to uh, Soviet cosmonauts. So um, he has actually contributed to the development of the um, uh, cosmic science um, as much as Tsiolkovsky. He came up with the uh, very term um, cosmonautica, cosmonautics, and um, he has been working a lot towards developing um, the trajectories of, of the spaceships. Um, born in Poland, he um, uh, studied in France and later in life was very much infatuated with the um, ideas of communism and moved to um, Soviet Russia. Um, in the 30s, his passport was stolen from the um, hotel where he was staying with his wife and um, um, Poland was never uh, agreeing to receive him back. He was offered by the Soviet state to take on uh, Soviet citizenship, which automatically at the time meant that he was unable to leave the Soviet Union ever again. And even uh, though all, all he was trying to later um, move back to Poland, that was, that was impossible. Um, until 1934, he was working at the uh, Research, Institute, Research Space Institute. Um, I, in that year, in um, I think 1936, the majority of people working in the institute were put into um, uh, labor camps, uh, um, most of them including also Sergei Karalev. Ari Sternfeld wasn't uh, arrested luckily, but after that he was never um, led to work officially and continue his research officially. He was doing that um, you know, for himself, he was writing a lot, he was giving lectures, but he was never allowed to um, take on uh, a real position, a real job. Um, even though he was very famous internationally and he was always invited by international institutions to give lectures outside of the Soviet Union, but that opportunity never came out. And uh, the third story um, that I would like to, to talk about is the story of the first Jewish cosmonaut, Boris Valenov, uh, image on the, on the um, left, a very iconic um, in a way, because if you think of the um, pictures with Yuri Gagarin, which were multiplied and which were very known and appearing to the public, um, um, the, the story of, of Boris Valinov is, is not as successful. Uh, he was supposed to be going to the space first, but due to the fact that he was uh, Jewish, um, he was not uh, let to do that. So uh, a few of the planned flights um, were canceled, and then he only um, was able to, to go to space in um, uh, 1969. Um, which also coincided with um, first migration of, of Jews outside of the uh, Soviet Union when they were moving to, to Israel or uh, the US. And um, this project also um, brings um, to brings kind of sheds light on, on the uh, um, movement of refuseniks. Uh, Jewish people who wanted to move to out, uh, 
away from uh, the Soviet Union, but were not allowed to do that. Um, they were also kind of neglected and uh, tortured by the government. They were not led to uh, practice religious rituals, uh, celebrate the holidays, Hebrew was prohibited, and um, the, the entire kind of vacuum that was created around um, Jewish and Yiddish culture in the Soviet Union is also very much uh, present in, in the project, and the, the Refusnik movement is um, also kind of um, paralleled with this space exodus. So the, the idea of um, um, you know, a Jewish cosmonaut uh, going to the space is also um, linked with the idea of, of Soviet Jews to, to leave the Soviet Union where um, they were unable to, to feel free and to be Jewish. So um, uh, just a few more uh, slides. For instance, this is the combination of the very famous um, and you know traditional canonic um, uh, monuments uh, to the achievements of the Soviet space program that were uh, placed almost in every city and of course in the in the large cities. Uh, most of them are. Um, showing uh, Yuri Gagarin in different ways, in different formats. Some are more f futuristic, some are more uh, traditional maybe, and the others are just um, you know, um, representing the entire so Soviet space program. And they are combined with the uh, slogans of the uh, Jewish American activists. They were also uh, fighting for uh, uh, the freedom of the, of the Soviet Jews, so that's uh, sort of a um, combination of uh, very glorious history of the Soviet Union of the time and this uh, quite shameful um, anti-Semitic uh, ideology that was operating on the state level. Um, later, um, no, now I want to, um, if we talk about legacy and representation of um, um, certain groups in, in, in the space and how much we know about it, how much has been communicated. We are used to think of, you know, spacemen as um, white men and um, even though there are quite a few women in, in the space program, their names um, are often forgotten or neglected. And I want to now give the um, uh, floor to Andrea who will speak about the female legacy uh, in the space. Sorry, just, it's a very big talk, so I, I had to uh, narrow down it a little bit. in to my interest in female cosmonauts. This elite group of military aviators flew at night without lights and did incredible acts that their fellow male aviators were not capable of. These are images of Valentina Tereshkova, the first woman in space. She was also the youngest woman in space. And she was the only woman to make a solo space flight in the Vostok 6. This is an image of the very small object that she realized that flight in. Through her life, she never was asked to go back up into space. This is something that she wanted to do and was not allowed to, as she saw her fellow male cosmonauts go forward. These are the second, third, and fourth female cosmonaut and astronauts to go into space. 
One thing that I find interesting is the story surrounding the final transmission of the lost female Russian cosmonaut uh, from the early 1960s before Yuri Gargarin became the first man to go into space. The lost cosmonaut is sometimes called a conspiracy theory, alleging that Soviet cosmonauts entered outer space but without their existence having been acknowledged by either the Soviet or Russian space authorities. Several articles and books have been published on the subjects and there are recordings. These recordings have not been validated by the Russian government, but they still are interesting in the thought that these were test experiments that failed. The one very haunting recording, if it is real, is of a female cosmonaut coming back into Earth's atmosphere while she is burning in her spacecraft. Galina Balashova's work was introduced to me by Catherine Lewis, curator of the International Space Programs at the Smithsonian Institute's National Air and Space Museum, specializing in Soviet Russian programs in Washington, D.C. Interestingly, besides Catherine, when I went to Smithsonian to do research, I found the American staff at the museum reluctant to discuss the achievements of the Soviet space program in relation to that of NASA's. I was told by staff from the U.S. State Department later that the Smithsonian is an American institution and that I needed to remember and keep it in mind. I thought that this showed that the Cold War still haunts the U.S. space program, unfortunately. I have worked closely with the amazing staff at the Museum of Cosmonautics in Moscow, and this institution has a very different attitude towards space travel and focuses on the international success of all countries and of all space travelers. They also have a motto, there are no politics in space. It is a unified space place amongst all countries and all people. They are also highly involved with the International Space Station for which I'm working on a project for. These are paintings and landscapes that Galina Balashova used in her interior designs for the space capsules. Galina's work has had a growing interest in the last few years, yet I question why the key architect interior designer and aesthetician of the Soviet space program with the designer of the Suez capsules in Salute and Mir space stations, now in her late 80s, was only given public credit for her pioneering work in 2015. This happened when the German author Philip Muser discovered her, in her words, and published a monograph of her work. On her experience through lectures and interviews <coughs> working for the Soviet space program, she said, it was like a cake that you're forced to eat in one sitting. She also went on to say that back then, often they sent young specialists to work in a place where there was no accommodation for them, explaining that she was forced to sleep in the place of her work. And officially there was no such job, and I doubt there is now. It was unofficial and unpaid, but it was really happy work. So Balashova remained in the architecture department where her boss, she recalled, was a plumber by profession, but she was a, a relative of the boss and she had been made the chief architect. So all of the work on the spacecraft was done at home, in the evenings and on weekends. Frustrated by her situation, Balashova finally got the courage up to ask her, her superior to be transferred to the design department and his response was damning. Do you really think anyone needs your work? For the money they get, they get cosmonauts would, would fly in a tin can, she recalls him saying. 
Balashova finally got her transfer when she began on the Soviet lunar program. But since her role didn't officially exist, there was no title for it. Balashova's job was an engineer, meaning she was paid less than an architect. She went on to say, I was the most junior person, almost like a servant. My work wasn't considered important because it wasn't included in the spacecraft design plans. After years on the same salary of 140 rubles per month, the architect, in her words, got offended and went back to the architecture department where her salary was immediately raised. The design department soon felt their loss and lured her back with another pay raise. I only ever got paid with a raise twice in my life, once when I left the design department and once when I came back. After that, I stayed there. Even after she was transferred to the design department, Balashova received no public credit for her work. I wasn't allowed to sign my design, she says. The bosses said that it was classified, but in fact, it was nothing of the sort. They would sign their articles in journals and newspapers, but I wasn't allowed to. They just didn't want some woman featured anywhere. Likewise, when Balashova designed the emblem for the Apollo Suez test project for the Paris Air Show in 1973, she was not paid or thanked or only found out last year through the Germans that the design had actually won the international award back then. The iconic emblem had been patted in by Moscow. The bosses would do anything they wanted. It was upsetting, but you got used to it and the work was interesting, she went on to say. These are stills from Andrei Tarkovsky's Solaris science fiction film. These scenes are of interest to me because I feel that they depict and are influenced from Galina Balashova's interior designs with the landscape paintings and the kind of homely feeling amongst the spaceship. Galina's work is a subject of a current video installation project I am working on with a corresponding series of photo montage collage constructions. I have been working with the Museum of Cosmonautics in Moscow, where they have several interiors preserved of the interiors of her space capsules and a number of design elements in their collection. I will be shooting on location in Galina's actual space capsule environments, and I I'm also working on arranging a personal interview with her at her home outside of Moscow this summer. Um, so I think it's a very interesting story that is uh, being brought to you know, public attention and Andrea is now working towards making this project realized. Uh, hopefully Galina Balashov will be able to be a part of, of this video because due to her age, she is not uh, very strong and, um, you know, not very capable maybe of, you know, committing to being interviewed, but um, I hope that her legacy will somehow be uh, presented um, in an art project that will be shown internationally. We're planning um, an exhibition with Andrea and Axel next, next year um, in Israel, and I hope it gets there. Um, and we all will also travel to, to other places as well. Um, I now wanted to switch to the local context and, you know, s since we're here in, in the shelter, such a remnant of, of, of the Cold War, um, I also wanted to speak um, about uh, a project that is also um, a consequence uh, of, of the spirit of this era, uh, which is the, the Finnish Space Initiative or program society, um, and I will um, ask Mika to, t to talk about it um, because he is the president uh, of the Finnish Astron Astronautical Society, and uh, I am very much interested in learning about the history of that project. History and contemporary context, what was happening then, how did this project come into being, and how it has developed over time, 
what was its impact on uh, different spheres in uh, um, science and different industries in Finland and what uh, society represents at the moment. I'll switch to your presentation as well. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the Finnish Astronautical Society or Suomen Avaruustutkimusseura is uh, a 60 year old, actually quite exactly 60 years old society uh, in Finland. Uh, and we have already started the uh, anniversary celebrations by flying some rockets and uh, we'll continue this year with other, other kinds of events. Uh, but actually I'm going to uh, start a little bit uh, further, both spatially and temporally. Um, go next. And uh, this picture reminds me of uh, my, uh, of all things, my uh, old Finnish teacher when I was a kid. And uh, she said that uh, you never ever start your presentation or essay or anything by saying that uh, already the ancient Chinese. But um, well, today I think uh, she would uh, forgive me because uh, the ancient Chinese about a thousand years ago were actually the people that uh, invented the rocket. Uh, how that happened uh, probably is uh, not very well known and uh, it would take quite some time to uh, go through the details, but uh, I think they should be given the credit. Uh, rockets started as, and uh, for a long time, uh, for most of the part, they were uh, weapons of war. And uh, as weapons, uh, no, no. Sorry. come back. Yeah. <laughs> as, as, as weapons, because uh, warfare is uh, largely a thing of uh, national pride and uh, the great things uh, people think in the history have been done in the wars. So uh, it has been an important thing. So, so the rockets as weapons, they were very important for the national uh, grand thoughts and uh, at the same time, there, were, there was this uh, aspect of uh, beauty and uh, visuality. And uh, because of that, uh, the rockets also took their part in uh, arts. And uh, one of the very old arts, uh, fireworks, enjoyed by people and as you can see also other kinds of audiences. This is my uh, West Siberian Laika Oda that uh, absolutely enjoys fireworks. <laughs> yes, so she loves it. So uh, that really uh, like brings together the, the joy and, uh, and also the, the most horrible parts of human life. And, uh, and rockets play a part in both. But uh, luckily uh, for, uh, for our generations, uh, the the aspect, the, the national pride aspect took a turn towards something more peaceful and uh, something that uh, most, hopefully most people uh, can uh, enjoy uh, and have good feelings about it. Uh, and uh, people turned the weapons towards space and uh, started bringing other things than weapons up from Earth and uh, towards the space. And uh, this is actually uh, the era, this is um, already 10 years, or yeah, pretty much uh, exactly 10 years after the Finnish Astronautical Society, uh, Sats was born. But uh, it was because of this uh, space exploration era. This was the golden era of uh, space exploration, the, the late 50s and uh, the 1960s. Uh, maybe also the early 70s, but uh, since then it's kind of had uh, a downturn, unfortunately. But, but anyway, uh, the Finnish Astronautical Society was uh, uh, founded in 1959 by uh, a few, not too many, like uh, I think there were four or remember, yeah, four, four mostly Swedish speaking uh, Finns that were really, really enthusiastic about everything about space. But uh, most of all, uh, which actually 
describes the uh, Finnish astronautical society even today most of all the things that we use to go to the space uh, rather than just look at the space itself so rockets and uh, spacecraft the communications equipment and everything that you use the technology and uh, here we have a few uh, pictures from the early days uh, these guys they actually built their own rockets and uh, well we do we do still but uh, these guys also um, built the motors that uh, took those rockets uh, not quite to space but quite high or well some of them they just exploded just like our motors uh, nowadays but uh, luckily it's it's not that bad right uh, the ice ice is a nice place uh, to fly rockets you have uh, a lot of space around and uh, you might even find uh, things that fly up and inevitably come down because even though uh, we call our society uh, the astronautical society uh, the things that we build ourselves they mostly come down to earth uh, but not exactly everything uh, uh, the Finnish Astronautical Society is a group of uh, both hobbyists and also professionals. There are some space professionals, uh, mostly from uh, the Finnish Meteorological Institute, uh, FMI or Suomen Ilmatieteen Laitos. And uh, these people, they actually build instruments that go into space probes. And uh, there are some right now on the surf surface of not Earth, but Mars that are making measurements and uh, sending them by radio back to us. So um, the society is uh, a very heterogeneous uh, bunch of people. But uh, I would say that the, the most active uh, group of uh, hobbyists is uh, still, as it was in the beginning of, of the society, it's the rocketeers, the people that build and fly rockets. And, uh, well, you see two of us here, me and uh, Axel, we, we do fly rockets. Actually, uh, the slightly weird uh, sentence there in uh, the uh, introduction by Maria, uh, that was actually uh, not the short form, but the long form of actually flying rockets. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, I already, as a kid, I, I was thinking about uh, careers. Of course, the first thing, the first career option that uh, I had in my mind was uh, becoming an astronaut. Of course, I think uh, there are roughly half of the kids that uh, want to become astronauts. Uh, I don't know how many. I think at least half of them must be thinking about that. But uh, obviously it didn't come, come to be, so uh, I had to find out something new. Okay, pilot. I'll become a pilot. and. Uh, well, I have flown some airplanes. I don't have any uh, license to fly any, but luckily there, so there has always been a pilot with me that uh, takes care of the plane, really. But uh, tried tried to fly some things. Actually, even flew some uh, aerobatics on a uh, 1940s uh, uh, fighter trainer plane in the U.S. Uh, but. Even that didn't come to be, uh, well, you see one of the reasons, uh, I have glasses, that wasn't okay for a pilot uh, at that time, and uh, well, it was not the only thing, of course. But uh, then the third option, ah, oh, let's become a scientist, I want to be a scientist. And you know, I am one now. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm working on my PhD at Aalto University. And, uh, well, we can talk about that later if uh, you want, but uh, maybe we'll look at the things that uh, we are doing on the hobby, hobby side for a while. So you have seen uh, some of our rockets, and uh, now what we are doing here is uh, look at the old plants from the 50s and uh, 60s, maybe even, I don't think there are any from 70s, do you think? Not, not this one is alpha, sorry. It's, it's in the 70s. 60s. 60s, okay. So uh, many of these uh, old rockets, they, they were big projects. They were like 
much bigger than most of the things that we fly nowadays. But uh, uh, also they were really challenging. And uh, unfortunately, many of them never really flew. And uh, on the other hand, uh, some of these plants got a revival uh, lately, because uh, Axel here has uh, taken some of them as uh, models for smaller model rockets. And uh, did we already fly some of them? Th yes. There was this yes. one. Yeah, yeah, there was one. One small rocket that was modeled uh, after the Alpha, or one of those uh, test models for the Alpha rocket. So uh, you can kind of combine many things together. It's uh, in, in this hobby, it's uh, from one part, it is uh, like model aviation. You, there is this uh, uh, almost eternal uh, dream of uh, humankind to fly. And even if you can't fly yourself, you fly something. Uh, then there is this uh, power and beauty of the rockets, and uh, obviously also uh, that uh, plays some note on uh, an artist's mind as well. And uh, there is the crafts side, and uh, building things, and uh, making beautiful things. And, and also uh, some part of it is the science. Um, well, we are not really talking about rocket science here as in the rocket science as the difficult thing. It's uh, the, the hobby and uh, the hobby rockets, they are not, not exactly difficult, but still very, very interesting stuff. Here we are building something slightly bigger. Uh, actually loading 19 uh, model rocket motors into uh, a rocket that we call Monster for obvious reasons, because usually you use, you use one of those motors for a rocket and uh, for once want to fly something bigger. And uh, I guess uh, we will also see it fly on this video. Uh, in the meanwhile, while uh, me and uh, Timo are there, we're preparing it for the flight. Uh, I might uh, tell a little bit of uh, my work because there is some a little connection between uh, the hobby and the work. Although uh, my research is about uh, food security uh, and agricultural resources, much of uh, the data that we use actually comes from remote sensing. Remote sensing means uh, we have uh, things that fly above, either airplanes or nowadays usually uh, satellites and they take images, they take uh, different kinds of images, visual or uh, other wavelength images. Okay, now I guess we are going to see it fly. There it went. Pretty fast and uh, get beautiful inverted uh, mushroom cloud. Uh, by the way, the, there is uh, one instance when I was building something at home that was uh, maybe close to 20 years ago, uh, my daughter, oh, yeah, coming down was not exactly as planned. The, the monster is uh, nowadays just the tail of the monster, but it will fly again. We will build it, we will rebuild it, and uh, I'm sure it will find, fly again. Okay, yeah, yeah, building something at home. Uh, I uh, just tested something that produced a small, uh, big cloud of smoke, and uh, we still remember my daughter, uh, uh, she, she just uh, cried, not, uh, not uh, scared, but uh, enthusiastic. She cried, mother, mother, uh, daddy made a mushroom cloud. <laughs> so that was really something that uh, also uh, uh, somehow inspired a uh, five, six year old girl. Okay, yeah, the, about my work. Yeah, the, we, we use uh, a lot of remote sensing data, these images from spacecraft. And uh, I think there are so many things that uh, the humanity does nowadays that uh, really couldn't work without space technology. It's not just remote sensing, taking pictures. Uh, of course, those are important for us to know what kind of weather we are going to expect. Uh, that's the data for the climate models. But uh, also the communications and uh, maybe even more everyday thing nowadays is the uh, GPS and other positioning systems so that uh, 
almost everybody uses space technology today. There is one other really interesting big rocket and uh, this guy Matti is uh, one of the uh, more technologically oriented uh, rocketeers in our society. He builds uh, not just the airframes, the, ex uh, the actual rocket, but uh, also electronics that guide it and uh, measure things and uh, uh, operate the uh, different aspects of the flight. Okay, uh, going ba back and forth between uh, rocketry and uh, my work. Uh, maybe I'd like to ask you something. Uh, just raise your hand. Uh, how many of you guys eat something? Not just now, but, you, but usually you, you, I, I guess most of you eat. You have walked here. So uh, how many of you eat to stay alive? Yeah, everybody. Does anybody think that food has some other value than just staying alive? I have about as many hands up as there are people. So I think uh, for most of the part, uh, people think food is uh, a really important, really intrinsic aspect of life. And uh, it, it really has uh, other value than just uh, a resource that uh, makes life possible. And uh, my work is related to uh, being able to provide for the humanity the food that it needs to stay alive without taking away the aspects of quality and uh, aspects of uh, enjoyment in food. So uh, the agricultural resources are uh, really crucial uh, for the survival of the humankind. But uh, because there are every day there are more of us, now something like seven and a half billion, and uh, within a few decades we will probably have nine, maybe 10 billion people, and uh, some forecasts are even, should I say worse, even higher maybe. And uh, we need to think about uh, the ways we produce our food. And uh, one of the aspects of uh, producing food is uh, the balance between uh, producing crops and uh, livestock or animal-based foods. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, produces a lot of controversies uh, between uh, scientists and also uh, just ordinary people choosing their foods. And uh, yeah, my, my uh, work is about uh, finding ways of uh, producing different kinds of food without overwhelming the natural resources. And uh, changing what we eat is uh, one of the things, but also changing what we produce regardless of uh, uh, whether it's uh, animal or crop-based foods. Those, uh, those are things that we can do to uh, change well, I could say change the world, but at least uh, at least change uh, uh, what our impact is uh, about, or uh, what uh, what the impact of our uh, food production and uh, our existence is on the rest of the uh, ecosphere. Okay, uh, would somebody like to ask something? Or I, I just have one question yeah. before we jump to uh, what Axel is doing in relation to the society and um, you know referring to what I was talking uh, about before I didn't notice a single woman in in the society is there a certain policy gender policy uh, related to your work or women aren't just so interested in building rockets as men or is is it just a, a male club in a way so what what's the reason behind that? It's absolutely not a male club. The problem is that there are not that many ladies that uh, have been interested in flying rockets, but that has changed lately. Uh, we organize uh, rocketry uh, courses, and uh, on those courses, uh, for at least three years now, on every course, we have had at least one lady. So hopefully that will change. Uh, the ladies that have participated in the courses have not been quite as active in actually flying the rockets that they built, 
but uh, I would say that they have probably built the most beautiful rockets that uh, we have seen on our courses. Hopefully, uh, they uh, will become as active as the guys and uh, will start appearing more on the videos. That would be great. So next video yep. with women. <laughs> yep. How long does it take to do a course and to learn to build a rocket? One evening. Ah. One evening. It's uh, maybe so I'll. It's a workshop. Do I have a few minutes more? Okay. Uh, this model rocketry thing is uh, is actually something that is uh, pretty simple. It originated about the same time as the uh, Finnish uh, Astronautical Society was founded in the late 50s in the United States. That's actually one of the reasons why I chose, I could just as well have chosen uh, one of the great Soviet Union rockets uh, as uh, an example of the space race. But I just took the uh, Saturn V because that was something that inspired people in the US to actually try and make rocketry a hobby that everybody could attend. And uh, that happened like, uh, yeah, at the end of the 50s, and uh, there was uh, one very prominent guy called uh, uh, Vernon Estes that uh, founded a company to produce rocket motors so that uh, you don't have to build the motors anymore like uh, yourself. That was the dangerous part of the hobby. So uh, many people uh, blew up their fingers or uh, uh, other damage was caused by the rocket motors that they built, but now it was possible to buy them. And uh, that made the hobby uh, simple enough that uh, in many schools in the United States, uh, even until today, uh, in many schools there are like physics classes that they just, uh, as an example, they build a rocket and fly it on the school front yard. So it's, it really is something that everybody can attend, even, even children. Here in Finland we have um, an age limit of 18 years for uh, pyrotechnic uh, devices like the rocket motors. But uh, even in our society, we have uh, several eight-year-old actually uh, in, in the flying events. Uh, there are even younger kids that uh, actually launch the rockets by pushing the buttons. And uh, they are probably the most enthusiastic of all. So um, really, it is simple. And uh, you can attend if you want. You can send me email. It's just uh, my name dot uh, at gmail.com that's the easiest way or alto.fi that's uh, another alternative so um, yeah would be nice Any thank other? you I, I think we'll maybe switch to questions uh, in the end of our yep. talk and now i'd like to give the floor to axel who is who has joined the society uh, recently as an artist and uh, started to explore it from the artistic point of view. And uh, if you could talk um, about your um, experience and, and your vision uh, of that, that would be uh, great. And I'll start your presentation. Okay, so hello, I'm Axel Strashnoy, as it says there. Um, so, because Mika has been talking so well and so precisely about the society, I thought I should talk about something else. And I would like to talk how I, about how I ended up, you know, in the society, or why I ended up in the society. And just to go briefly, yes, please. So it's a bit scary to, to talk about Russian cosmism in an audience that I know there's several people who speak Russian at least because almost nothing has been translated into Russian and I've been reading everything by hearsay. By, uh, I understand Fyodorov was the, the founder of the cosmist movement. If you can. And basically uh, Fyodorov had this, uh, this philosophy that he called the philosophy of the common task. And uh, he called the common task that uh, we all had the responsibility to bring back to life our ancestors. And of course, if one brings back to life their ancestors, then they have to bring back their own ancestors, and so on and so on and so on, until everybody who has ever lived would be alive again. So uh, he the state after this has been achieved will be a state where there's no 
birth nor death. We are all alive at the same time. And uh, one more. And one of the problems, well, there's two problems. I mean, Fyodorov was thinking about this in quite practical matters, even if you wouldn't expect so. So one of the problems was how to find the parts of the ancestors that have been spread through space. So already in his, uh, in his text, he writes about the need to, to get to space to find these parts of these ancestors that we have a duty to uh, recover. And also he realized that uh, if we bring back to life everybody who has ever lived, we won't fit in the earth. So we would need more um, living space, which is well, a horrible phrase nowadays, but wasn't when he was writing this. So the need to colonize planets would come just from the fact of overcrowding the earth. And uh, well, Fyodorov uh, was a very strong influence on Tsiolkovsky, who is considered the father of cosmonautics. And uh, so he was the first, I mean, this was a description by someone else, but he's the first person to uh, think all the things needed to think about, to make, to launch and sustain life inside rockets today. And I have a list of his achievements because I think it's amazing, which is in the next slide. So he developed aerodynamic test methods for rigid airframes. He solved the problem of rocket flight in a uniform field of gravitation, calculated the amount of fuel ne needed to overcome the Earth's gravitational pull, invade the gyroscopic stabilization, and discovered a method for cooling the combustion chamber with ingredients of the fuel itself, which is still something we use today. And this was, um, of course, his achievement influenced by um, Fyodorov's writings. And so I, I, I mean, reading about space, I was very interested in, in, because this is not the departure point we normally think about when we think about space exploration. Of course, as, as Mika said, rocketry itself that, uh, was developed by the Chinese with other objectives, but uh, directing it to, uh, to astronautics, to exploration of space, was uh, the result of this cosmist influence. And I think, uh, and it was a result of this need of uh, bringing our ancestors back to life, which I thought was great. The other uh, strong influence in my, um, in my research that took me to rocketry was Hannah Arendt. And I have just two quotes because I think she says it better than I say it. So <coughs> the first quote is this, that the most radical change in the human condition we can imagine would be an immigration of men from the Earth to some other planet. Such an event, no longer totally impossible, would imply that man would have to live under man-made conditions, radically different from those, those the Earth offers him. Neither labor, nor work, nor action, nor indeed thought as we know it, would then make any sense any longer. And second quote, but, but, but it, could, it could be that we, who are Earth-bound creatures and have begun to act as though we were dwellers of the universe, will forever be unable to understand, that is to think and speak about the things which nevertheless we are able to do. So my interest in rocketry or in, as an artist approaching uh, space uh, travel is, comes from this, this sentence, that uh, from the realization that we need to find ways of thinking and speaking about this thing that we can do, which is uh, leave the earth, live in space, maybe eventually even in other, um, in other planets. And yes, please. And that is very much connected to this image. This is an image taken by the crew of the Apollo 17, which I think was the last Apollo mission, Mika? Yes. Yes? And it's called the Blue Marble. And there's at least uh, this idea that the conservationist movement began from this image, because this is the first image, of course, there were people in space before, but this is the image that gave people the idea that we are all alive uh, together on this little blue ball, this little blue marble in the middle of space. And, you know, if we break this, if we break our home, there's, you know, we are dead. So the, uh, we needed to go to space to be able to look back to Earth and understand where we are 
And I think that's quite interesting. Uh, it's, an, it's a relationship that's not normally explored between space and conservation. And it goes even further because, well, as you all know, we have to stop emitting carbon quite radically. But uh, there's, there's people who do not believe we are going to make it. We are going to totally overshoot our carbon, carbon targets. And therefore, there's the need for a plan B. And uh, the first plan B is geoengineering, which means altering, uh, instead of altering our climate without meaning to, as we have done so far, it's about altering the climate willfully. And one of the easiest ways of doing that is what's called stratospheric aerosol injections, which would mean about um, launching about 4,000 rockets a year with uh, sulfates into this stratosphere so that they would deflect this, the light of the sun. So even if we have carbon in the atmosphere, we wouldn't get so hot. And the other solution is to put a mirror in space. So both solutions require rockets. And one more. And then um, the great Elon Musk said, one uh, of course, one path is to stay on Earth forever, and there will be some extinction event. The alternative is to become a multi-planetary species, which, we are, which I hope you will agree is the right way to go. So there's a, there's a background to SpaceX, which is the, the realization that we might fuck up the Earth and need to move somewhere else, <laughs> which is not necessarily the most positive uh, take on Earth. I don't know if we have. And of course, if we move to Mars, there's, uh, which is great, Mars is very cold, and Mars doesn't have an atmosphere, but Mars has uh, frozen water in the poles. So if we could warm up the Earth, why couldn't we warm up Mars, are some people <laughs> thinking. So, and, uh, uh, and this is not a joke, there's people who have studied detonating nuclear weapons, nuclear, uh, yes, in the pole, over the poles of Mars, so that the heat wave does release, would release, uh, would heat up the poles and melt the water, and they would be running water in Mars again. So there's this plan that of, uh, like I think it's a hundred or two hundred years that it takes to bring uh, to get an atmosphere on Mars and running, you know, liquid water. And of course, their gravity will not be the same as Earth, but it, in, and it might still be a bit cold, but it will be a lot more livable than it is now. So I think, well, this is kind of the, if there's uh, geoengineering, this is um, Mars engineering. But um, I, I find very interesting this, this arc that comes from, the co from cosmism and uh, kind of the duty to others that we have in, 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 in Fyodorov's case, the duty to our, our ancestors that have you know, created the need for space travel. And that now the current still existing duty to others that live with us that needs us to either launch rockets to deflect the solar light from the atmosphere or stratosphere to uh, you know, creating a path for people to emigrate. Yeah. And well, that's, uh, that's how I ended up one day calling Mika and saying, well, I want you to know more about what's happening. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, may I ask you something? Yes. Do you believe there is life on Mars? I, well, it's a difficult question. I, I would say that the problem we have is that we understand life in a very specific Earth. Um, how say it, from, a, from an Earth point of view, what life is. So the quest, I think the, the question is quite interesting is, what would life on Mars be? Because we assume that life needs water and oxygen, and it might be that there's living things that do not need that. Yes, the, the thing that I was thinking about uh, this uh, terraforming of Mars is that uh, you were talking about uh, extinction events on Earth. That would be an extinction event for the life on Mars, if we would do that. Yes, but <laughs> to me, I mean, I come from Argentina originally, and we all have, um, we all learn about the colonization of um, the American continent. And if you read texts about, uh, the moment where Columbus went to America and all the ideas they had about, uh, especially analytical text, is a little bit the same as uh, what's the discussion about Mars. For example, there's a really interesting uh, thinker called Todorov, 
and he because I mean basically for the Europeans there was no civilization and he says that when they get to the Aztec capital to Tenochtitlan which is amazing they're forced to destroy it and they had to destroy it because they had already decided that, that in America there were no civilizations so they destroy it so that they can claim that there's no civilization so I think if you read some of the texts about the colonization of other planets they have exactly the same tone as the text that you know, Columbus was maybe writing to the kings about what he was finding. That's a very, very interesting view and uh, also maybe tells even more about our history than the future. Well, it's uh, something to be seen someday. Uh, there, were this, uh, there was this image of uh, the blue marble and uh, I would like to uh, mention a couple of other important photos. Uh, I don't have them with me here, but uh, actually even better than uh, showing them to you, I would urge you to uh, find them on the web. It's not very difficult. One of them is called Earthrise. You might have, may have seen this before. Uh, it was uh, taken by the uh, Apollo 8 crew. crew. That was uh, the first uh, Apollo mission that uh, went to the moon without actually landing on the planet, but uh, they got there and back. So that is an important image, uh, and uh, it, it kind of shows uh, for me that uh, Earth is a planet of water. Uh, it's mostly blue, just like the blue marble here. And uh, almost everything, if you look at Earth from the space, uh, almost everything that you see is water. It's either ocean or clouds. Very rarely do you actually see any land. There, slight, just a little bit hazy land underneath the cloud cover, and then ocean. So uh, there is not really that much water on Earth, though. So um, I would say that uh, we really need to take good care of uh, what we have. Uh, almost all life, or actually exactly all life on Earth is totally dependent on water. And uh, the other picture that uh, I would like to, you to find is uh, called the play, uh, pale blue dot. It's uh, another astronomical picture taken by the Cassini probe. And uh, just looking at it, at it uh, you will see that uh, if we don't take good care of the water and uh, the other resources that we have here on Earth, it's a heck of a long way to get any more. Thank you. We'll definitely look them up. Um, I, I wanted also to switch to a little bit of a different perspective and bring us back to the artistic sphere and field. And um, we, we were talking now with you like from a very wide perspective uh, on the space. So I um, would like to talk a little bit about Afrofuturism and um, how it has developed as a movement. And um, I would actually like to give floor to um, on that to um, Andrea again, um, because she has a few examples um, of works by American artists. And then I would also like to speak a little bit uh, about the Zambian space program, which is not that much known about. Yeah. Philosophy of science and philosophy of history that explores the developing intersection of African diaspora culture with technology. Afrofuturism addresses themes and concerns of African diaspora through technoculture and science fiction. Seminal Afrofuturistic works include the novels of Octavia Butler, also the visual artists such as John Michel Basquiat and Rene Cox, and also musical groups such as Parliament Funkadelic and Sun Ra. These are images from the mothership a stage prop that has also become a pop culture object in the United States. Okay. 
Afrofuturism emerged during the Cold War era and directly responded to the absence of African Americans in space. Instead, African American writers, musicians, and artists created fictional universes where they became space travelers, heroes, and with Sun Ra's cosmic philosophy as seen in films like Space is the Place, a planet where African Americans travel to and live in harmony through sonic vibrations. Rene Cox's Rajay series of photographs draws inspiration on the origin myth of the comic book character Wonder Woman. But in her series, she picks up on the reference of Nubia, who is Wonder Woman's African cousin, and turns her into a sexy black superwoman who rids the world of racial injustice. Cox plays herself in these photographs, and she is also a bodybuilder. This heroine liberates the Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben from their demeaning stereotypes, wrestles with an older white businessman in outer space, and takes on Napoleon's army when soldiers shoot at the nose off of a sphinx. Cox embraces the sexual aspect of the heroine's power. Cox describes her as an extended Wonder Woman's battle against injustice into the realms of racism and colonialism. And in 1998 interview, she remarked, clearly this body of work exposes the ultimate truths and contributions, past and present, that blacks have made in the United States. It also gives little girls and women a sense of empowerment while illustrating to the female population that she can do anything and go anywhere without following the law of tradition and limitations. For my final slide, I am sharing with you two video stills from Jefferson Pinder's work, White Noise. In this video, which is a collection of some 2,000 photographs of the space race and the civil rights movement, Pinder reflects on the injustice and the irony in US history during the late 60s when the US government is putting a man on the moon for the first time, a white man, African Americans are fighting for the Civil Rights Act and we have Martin Luther King assassinated around the same time. I think that the message is clear that within all of the progress and at Americans' apogee, the African American is still not invited into space. Thank you very much and I look Sorry for um, you know the technical um, complications of of Andrea's presentation. I, I just wanted to uh, quickly because we are actually running out of time uh, and I also want to have few minutes for the questions, but um, I also wanted to, to bring your attention to the fact that um, um, space narratives uh, are also finding themselves in the uh, field of sci-fi and in this, um, um, you know, mockumentary genre, and it's often a combination of facts and fiction, um, and even all the familiar images um, that we know uh, about moon landing and other iconic um, and you know knowledge that seems to be engraved in stone um, about the space is always very questionable um, and for instance the the Zambian program um, or sp space Zambian program of uh, 1964 which was initiated by a science teacher Edward uh, Makuka Nkloso um, is still, um, you know, represented in 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 very different way. Was he uh, a mad person, or what? He's just a, a dreamer without any limits and boundaries. Uh, but his idea appeared um, at this rising race between the Soviet Union and and the USA, 
Um, and uh, he also wanted Africa to be represented in this race and um, to, he wanted Africa to have certain space um, and legacy um, in this confrontation uh, and in this uh, competition. So the, the, um, his idea was to send into space uh, a girl um, and a cat and a missionary because he believed that uh, uh, Christianity could be brought to Mars and uh, he was one of the first who wanted to concentrate on Mars um, rather than on the moon unlike the Soviet and the American space programs and he actually was fundraising uh, to make this uh, program happen um, but the girl who, that he was planned to send to the space was, was she got pregnant and um, the money was never there, and in the end, he was just laughed at uh, because of his crazy ideas. Um, nevertheless, um, this um, brave and courageous and uh, very bold idea was um, addressed um, by a few artists. One of them, um, I think maybe the most um, um, viral project is the uh, book by Christina de Middle, which is called Afronauts. Uh, the term um, coined by Nkoso for um, naming the um, uh, African cosmonauts, for giving him a certain specific name that would be attributed to uh, um, uh, their background. And um, it's also an imaginary um, attempt to, to recreate and maybe visualize um, that program and that idea that combines very futuristic um, imagery with um, native elements in um, uh, the, the costumes of the offernauts and in, in the way that um, program could be uh, visualized. So um, I, I want to talk to, to talk about your other artists, but I think we don't have time. So if you guys have any questions or comments, we'd be happy to take them now. Okay then, anything to add? I was just thinking what we were talking about, the um, conquest of America, because basically the conquest of America is the last time a European met a radical other. So meeting an extraterrestrial, the only, part, the only reference we have to meeting an extraterrestrial is the conquest of America. I mean, that's the biggest gap ever before that. So, you know, that's, I don't think we are really ready to meet an ET based on how that went, but um, yeah, maybe it's good to keep it in mind. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think that's the most positive uh, continuation of any talk I've ever there was had. One question. <laughs> I think there was one more question. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Just one more thing. Like, I'm wondering that all this uh, research about uh, the exploration of space, if it's really actually about ho going and living and colonizing other planets, or if it's about learning about our planet and actually what we are. Currently, what is being done is uh, exactly what you said uh, last. And uh, almost nothing of it is about leaving the Earth. But uh, if ever there is a reason or need to leave the Earth, or uh, at least for some to leave the Earth to continue the human race, uh, that will be uh, an important and uh, I would say even prerequisite for it to ever happen that we know what there is around us. Otherwise, there is never going to be even a chance. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. And um, see you in Mars. <laughs>